Hello, such wrong nation. Joe Simons, like diamonds, we're back again. And this is a special edition because, as you can see here, if you're listening on the podcast, you can't see this, but you, those of you watching on the YouTuber, I'm here with Captain John Owens in a real hotel room at ICAST. In the flesh. Day two, dude. Day two. Legs are starting to I, fill it. I'm worn out, man. One more day. Am, One more day, and then a little vacay. I am uh, I am worn out. Every year I have such a blast, and every year I am so worn out of talking all day and standing on your feet. And It's it's amazing. It's I look totally forward to iCast every year, yeah. and uh, by the third day, uh, I need a nap. <laughs> but I'm still excited, but I need a nap. Yes. <laughs> So we're going to talk all about flounder fishing. I see it in the community a lot, and I know you're part of the insider community, and they're super helpful. And I think especially here in Florida, and you guys have your own issues in, in Carolina with some, you know, some new changes on, on yeah. harvesting. Yep. But in, in Florida, you know, we had a recent change in the Gulf where we cannot really keep speckled trout and redfish and, and snook. And so a lot of people that, that including me, that occasionally do like to, to take a fish home and eat it, mm -hmm. they're like, well, what, what else? And, you know, we got some mangrove snapper, sheepshead, and then flounder. And flounder's yeah. one of the most tasty fish it, out it, there. It, yeah, I mean, we, we, you know, it's, I was talking to you earlier, we rarely do have a customer that releases a keeper flounder. They yeah. flounder, wow, it's yeah. great eating. So um, the, the, the pressure's there. People want to catch flounder. Yeah. Um, I love catching flounder. I, the last five years has really changed my business and more and more flounder fishing. Um, you know, they're not easy to catch. But then when you get on them, they're pretty easy to catch. And it's well, finding them and working them. That's you know? the goal here today, to make yeah. it easier. Because I, I think at least where I'm from, and I think a lot of the Floridians, and, and really all over the place, but they struggle with it because it's almost like a bycatch, right? Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. I, I'm seeing some of the comments and the questions that have come in are like, all right, how do I, how do I target flounder, not just catch it by accident? You know, and we'll, so we'll talk about that, the different seasons. We're going to talk about, you know, where to find them. And we're going to focus on artificial lures because I think that's another misconception is that, oh, I have to have live bait to, to get them, that they're only like little bottom feeders and I have to have a big weight and keep – it's not necessarily true at all. I mean, you're killing no, it. it, it it's do, you, a, do you use live bait at all or not? Very rarely yeah, anymore. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, when I, when I started flounder fishing when I was younger, they, you didn't use – you use live bait for flounder. You yeah. might use, you know, artificial for speckled trout and redfish. Yeah. But for flounder, it was it was live bait. And – I'm catching bigger and more fish since I have switched to artificials. Mm. Um, and I think the, the most important thing is why that's happening is presentation. Yeah. Is, is, a, is, a, is, is an artificial bait is such a great presentation. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when the lure gets to the fish, it's what they're trying to eat. It's the lure. Where when a, a Carolina rig gets to them, it's the weight. And I believe some fish could be spooked from that. Mm. Um, and also the fish waiting to bite that live bait. Everybody says you got to wait. Well, when they consume these, these artificials, there's no wait time. You set that hook. Yeah. And that makes it a lot easier for my customers that don't fish very often. Sure. Dead weight got the fish. None of that waiting for the bite. How long do I wait? I'm having to time them. There's none of that. Yeah. You, you got the fish on the end of the line. Love it. So let's let's go right into it. And let's go uh, geographically non-specific. Okay. You fished all over the place. Mm -hmm. And let, right now we're in the heat of summer. You're catching them. You're, mm -hmm. I've seen some pictures. You're doing pretty doggone well. Yep. So what, like, what kind of areas are you looking for? So take someone who's, once again, kind of a, a weekend warrior. They're great at catching redfish and maybe specks. But they're just struggling on catching the targeting the flounder. Where are they looking? Are they, is it the same areas? Is it well, it, you know, for me, when it starts getting a little hotter, um, you know, if, and I'm a, I'm a precursor North Carolina a little bit because yeah. it's where I'm from and that's what I'm bouncing stuff off of. But I know it's it's not different on down the coast because I talk to captains on down the coast, yeah. South Carolina, right on through Georgia and Florida. Um, but what we're seeing is when it gets warm, we're seeing the fish go a little bit deeper, okay. especially during the day. They will get shallow at nighttime, um, but they're getting a little deeper always with moving current. And what does deeper mean to you? I'm looking for about six to 15 foot. Okay. Will they be deeper? Absolutely. But inshore fishing, that, that 15 foot or shallow is a little easier to fish. Yeah. Um, finding those heavy structure areas, uh, marinas, docks, pilings, bulkheads. Now a lot of bulkheads aren't that deep, but if you can find those special bulkheads where, where you know, houses line uh, of the ICW with a bulkhead or a, or a nice creek or channel, and you've got that six plus depth of water, especially at low tide. Now where I'm from, we have a five foot tide. So that water could be 11 foot deep at, you know, at, at high tide and five or six foot deep at low tide. Well, guess what? That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. But yeah. if it's only five foot deep at high tide, there's no water there at low tide. So finding those deeper places, especially lower tide waters, 
current is very important and, and add the icing on top is seeing that bait fish move through there. Our finger mullet are starting to show up now yeah. and all of these bulkheads and deeper docks, when I see those mullets and they get to those docks, they, those fish know, redfish and flounder know that those mullets will stop for a second, either go around that dock, they don't like to go under them, yeah. or, it'll, or they'll hang out for a second before they make the fish run through because they're spooked of those pilings. There's something's hanging over their shade, their yeah. shadow, the shadow, and lines. they stop. Just... And those flounder fish know that something's going to happen. Those fish are going to break up a little bit. It's time for it to, to break them, them to, to pluck them off, oh. to ambush them. They're ambush fish. They're self feeders. They're waiting for the food to come to them. So look, take that 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 information and look for places where bait gets broken up. Some there's a rip. There's a point anywhere. But what, but what the point is for the hot summer is looking on those little deeper waters. In the spring, I'm catching some of these bigger fish in three, four, five foot water. Yeah. But when that water temperature starts to scratch in the mid 70s to, to 80s and above, yeah. I start to find those fish move down a little bit. And also, when you're in these areas, if you find a roll on your fish finder, let's say there's a bulkhead and you're going along and all of a sudden it goes from five feet to six or seven foot deep, oh, that edge, the top edge and bottom edge of that roll on that deep water bulkhead or dock. All right, so let, let's, this is a perfect example because everyone's seen that before if you fish enough. How do you fish that? Meaning, how are you positioning your boat? I, I've... Well, th that's a good question, but I'm going to put it in the good old dock in the waterway or channel because yeah. it sticks out in the water. you got that dock that sticks out. And you've got those drops. Typically, most of the time, those docks will run to fairly deep water, put a boat in. So typically, the gazebo area with the covered area and the ramp going down and the floating dock is usually where that channel starts to drop in. Then I'll go too much more because it'll be hard to drive those pylons in. Yeah. And here's the deal. You know, sometimes we find those trout and drum on that lower side. Flounder will be on the top and the bottom side of that roll. Okay. So I'm going to make sure that I'm working up and down those rolls on those docks. And you got the double scenario of the structure of the dock, the current movement, the bait coming through and that drop off. Anytime you can add more and more structure scenarios together, that kind of that mathematical equation of catching a fish, yeah. taking points to 100%, which is catching a flounder, you're going to catch fish. Cool. And so covering those drops, what works? The only thing I don't do when it gets hot is I, when you can start to clearly see the bottom. If you're in clear water, of course, clear water area, when you can start to clearly see the bottom on a sunny day, those flounders are not going to be there. And I know this because in the mornings when I'm going up creeks and I'm on shallow flats when I'm looking for redfish, I'm watching these flounder bust off these banks. But I've noticed that once the sun gets up higher in the day, I'm not pushing those flounders off those banks like I am in the morning. They're going to that little bit deeper water for safety. Because I can tell you, I see plenty of ospreys with a flounder in their talons. And it's weird. You'd think, of, why would they get a flounder on the bottom? Because early in the mornings, late in the afternoons, they're picking those fish that are sitting shallow. And you would never think they would. But I honestly see more flounder up our way in the talons of, of ospreys than I do any other fish. Mullet would be next. So Whoa. it's crazy, but we see a lot. They're usually smaller fish because the smaller fish do hang shower. Yeah. But so keep that in mind. The day gets a, little, gets a little higher. Those fish tend to drop down deeper. They're not going to move 100 yards. They're going to move 10 feet. Yeah. But they're going to find those deeper waters. And are you trying, in the summertime specifically, are you trying to get closer to passes or inlets where there's a lot more, you know, yeah, I mean, flow is always important. And the closer you are to the inlet, the more flow you're going to have by far. Um, but I will tell you that, that one thing, there's a little, little phenomenon on that that I found is, is you will find those flounder in the still water. But it's going to be deeper still water, but it's going to be right on the edge of the current. So if let's say you find a marina or something with some open water and you're going through there, sometimes marinas kind of get blocked off or private docks have a, a, you know, a neighborhood dock. Yeah. And you'll find an area that all of a sudden you can see that current strip, the current moving and the area that's not moving. Because yeah. you'll find plenty of fish in there. And what I think is they think those, those flounders are waiting for those minnows and stuff will come out of that current to take a break and hang out for a while. And they know that. It's like a highway. You know, on the side of the highway, waiting for someone to accidentally throw a $100 bill out the window. It doesn't happen very often, yeah. but they know what's going to happen, and they're going to be there for it. Yeah. And, you know, and it's going to land on the ground yeah. in that, in where there's no wind. So, yeah, you know, <laughs> idiot proof, but, you know, it, seriously, yeah, yeah. That, that's what it does. So, you know, I will find them in still water, but what I won't find them is if you got way back in that marina where there's not close to any moving water at all, yeah, yeah. is the only flounders I find back there are usually going to be smaller flounders. I'm yeah. not going to find the bigger fish or, as for sure, the trophy fish. The deeper and I won't say darker, but darker as in more structure and everything and more current and bigger bait fish and stuff, yeah. where you start finding those trophy fish, which are far and few. But, you, you know, some of the biggest fish I've caught have been in really big concrete piling areas, you know, bridge areas, bigger bulk commercial bulkheads and marinas. But there's always some current yeah. close by. All right. So let, let's go back to the, the positioning and, and kind of the approach. 
So let's just use use a dock or a bridge, whatever you want to. How how are you fishing there? You, I assume using a troll motor in your case, like ninety nine percent of the time I'm using a troll motor because okay. with flounder, very important. Now I'll say this, I, I, I'll preach it to you. You have to cover area. The fish are not going to come to you. Um, there's a lot of videos online of these flounders following lures. Those are northern fluke, and northern fluke are typically in open water, and they will follow lure. These flounders didn't get big by following lures. They, they wait, they stealth, they're fat and happy, they wait for the bait to come to them. Mm. I've had plenty of trout, drum, flounder, cobia, tarpon, sharks follow lure to the boat. I have never in my life looked in the water and said, oh my gosh, you just see that five pound flounder following my lure in? They don't do that. True. They're gonna wait for it to come to them. So covering that area, covering area, lots of cast. I do a lot of flip fishing, underhand fishing. Mm. Um, I'm a spinning reel guy by trade for my customers, but if I'm fishing a flounder tournament, I got a bait caster, a low profile bait caster, because I can throw it out and just put my finger on the spool and stop it because yeah. it's a lot of casts working every angle of the dock. Because every, I'd say, you need to work every two or three feet. It's not speed fishing. You want to do it as fast as you can to cover area, right. but you've got to be working that lure, you know, monotonously across the bottom. And I like to jump it. I want to jump that lure. I don't want to drag it. Dragging, unfortunately, you might hit the fish and spook them you're definitely going to get more hangs. You're going to find everything on the bottom. Oh, yeah. But when you're jumping that jig across the bottom, you're jumping over, t over stuff. Yeah. And have you ever seen a mullet drag their nose through the bottom or anything? They don't. They swim right. along. Right. So that jumping gives them that look and that drop, they're going to eat it. So the, it's, it's really, it's not hard. It's not, there's not a lot of technicality to it except for the fact that you just need to make sure you cover every angle on those breaks, on those current runs. You're covering that area very good. And with this fishing, you know, I can get to a redfish spot in about five or ten minutes. I know they're there or they're not there yeah. or they're biting or not biting. I mean, that's the question. Oh, yeah. With this fishing, if, you're, if you start fishing, if you call flounder there before, you're going to catch them again. But very important. you got to give yourself to co cover some area. If it's just me and one customer, we're going to fish an area a little longer flounder fishing to see if they're there. What does that mean to you? Like how long you would you I, I'd say in a, in a, let's say in a general dock area, I'm going to give it about 15 minutes. Okay. But if I have three or four people casting, Maybe 10 minutes, because that's three or four lines covered. you know. T and typically within the first two to five minutes, a customer's going to catch a flounder if they're biting. Got and it. that's for the inshore fishery, and we'll talk about the ocean as well, or the ocean fishery. If they're not, move on, because flounder hang together. I know this from catching them. If you catch one, you're going to catch more. But when I talk to divers and see them on the reefs or inshore, if there's one, there's 10. They confirm it. They're not by themselves. But if there's not one, there's none. There's yeah. not going to be just one or two. They're there or they're not. And that's helped me move on to new places and really watch the clock as I point at the wrong wrist. Watch the clock because if you're on a, you're out there on a beautiful day before you know it, you've run through a bunch of time yeah. and you haven't caught any fish and you've spent an hour at a spot where you could be hitting five or six spots in an hour. Yeah. So let's talk about the baits. We talked, you know, yeah. this is going to be flounder fishing on artificial lures. What's what's the go-to in the uh, in the summer? In, in the summer, inshore-wise, I yeah. like a long shank uh, jig head. And when I say long shank, just one has a little more a little more length to it. I usually use about a three-alt uh, hook. Okay. Um, and, and the one I like is I use a blue water candy. No endorsement here, but they make a great ball jig head with a long shank hook, okay. three eighths ounce. So I go a little three heavier. Eights, okay. And the reason is, if you fish a lot, you could probably get away with a quarter ounce. But I want that lure to stay close to the bottom and get to the bottom quickly. Now a lot of a lot of a lot of people say, why don't you go to a half ounce or something heavier? Well, there again, we still want that bounce. Yeah. Fish in deeper water. If you go too heavy, yeah, it's gonna get to the bottom quick, but you're gonna have to work it harder to jump. Three eighths ounce long shank, and I prefer a five or six inch Berkeley Gulp jerk shaft. Okay. If the pin fish get bad, and we have no shortage in North Carolina, oh my gosh. Pins and puffers. Pins dude. and puffers, no, that's no, right. No. And then we got a lot of lizard fish too. They oh, don't yeah. damage it as bad as a pin fish do. Yeah. The pin fish get real bad, and I will I will work through some gulp. I'll let them back the tails off some and keep fishing it. You yeah, know, yeah. You, you can, you know, five or six inch bait's got some play time. Yeah. I will go to a uh, Berkeley Power Bait grass pig, okay. which is a paddle tail lure with a, it's about five inches long, and it's a big five inch. It's scented. I still throw some extra scent on there, a little secret there, a little extra scent, just to get them to hold on. Um, but that bait's a little, a little bit more industrial. Okay. Is it as good as a gulp? No. Do I have good luck with it? Yes. But, but so only perfectly. when I have to push towards it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Because, because the trash fish are, are getting yeah. getting it so bad. You and, know? and what about Berkeley shrimp, the gulp shrimp? Do you gulp, use that? gulp shrimp are good. The problem is, is I found that I'm catching bigger fish and consistently more keepers by going with the bigger bait. Okay. Um, you know, and elephants eat peanuts, flounder fishing. I mean, we're catching 13 inch flounder on a six inch bait all day long. And our limit in North Carolina is 15 inches on flounder. So I, I have found that I'm, I'm catching bigger fish, more fish, and it seems to be more efficient fishing because also with that bigger bait, with a heavier jig head, you're getting more of that nice up and fall 
So I can go with a heavier jig head to get it down quicker and stay at the bottom. But when I jig it up by the, having that bigger bait, that fall is a little slower. And if you can get a little slower fall, it's going to look more natural. The reaction's probably going to be a better bite from the flounder. So you, you mentioned popping off the bottom. Uh, for those of you watching the video, you're going to be able to see this. What, what are you doing? Are you doing two pops, one pop? You change it up? What? Good question. What I like to do is it's, it's pretty standard. Is throw it out there. Keep the bell open until it gets to the bottom. Yeah. You, want to, you want to get that efficiency of cast. You want to come back to you. Let it hit the bottom. I come up tight, and I'm a good old lefty, everybody. So you see me rolling on the wrong side. And, and I, and what I, kind I, of pro are you? I swear. I swear. <laughs> thank gosh, thank gosh I, can, I can switch it out. <laughs> but I like to bump it across the bottom without reeling so I can feel what's going on. Okay. And I'll give it five or six bumps. Pretty much start low and get to the right pretty high so it's not comfortable anymore to work. Yeah. Let it drop back down to the bottom. Huge important. Excuse Let it drop strike, back down. Right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Reel in any slack. Now, not enough to move the lure, just to tighten up the line to that next angle yeah. to jig in. And usually what happens is you get bump, 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 and you'll get the dead weight there. Rarely will you feel them. If you're, you know, if there's not a lot of current, you might feel them, but usually it's dead weight. Yeah. And typically you go up and you go to jig again and the dead weight's there. No waiting around. Cross his eyes. Set that hook and have the you net ready. I, I don't know if I go full from that. I tell people we're not bass fishing, but don't be afraid to hit them because yeah. what happens a lot of times, my customers are jigging along and they're expecting a trout bite or a flounder bite, I mean yeah. a drum bite, that thump. And this is not always that way. I mean, I feel the bite sometimes, but a lot of people don't. Yeah. And so they're growing all of a sudden they feel dead weight and they go, I've got one. They start reeling. They never set the hook. They get the fish halfway up or right at the boat. I go to net it yeah. and it shakes the hook. Yeah. So you do still have to remember, even though you're not getting that, you know, normally that thump and you set the hook with a drum, yeah. it's still that dead weight. Come tight and then start reeling because you will miss them. And I have customers all the time that stop and look at me and say, I didn't set the hook. And they know, because I keep telling them, I keep confirming when they miss them, you've got to set the hook. Yeah. The fish is going to come out of nowhere, essentially. Yeah. All right. Talk about color, dude. Yeah. You, you know, I saw your post in the Insider Group, and we're here at ICAST, so I got to see him. But you, yeah. you got to see him before everyone else. Like, yeah, Berkeley that, came uh, out with some bright colors, dude. And I just really saw even more colors the last two days because I got a lot of samples, but they kind of they kind of sent me what they thought I use and what I've used in the past, kind of yeah. like what I like. And I saw some stuff today. I was like, oh, should have sent me that. But, you know, flounder, I'm not real particular on colors. I do go yeah. pretty bright, probably brighter than anything except for trout fishing. We get some pretty bright colors in trout yeah. fishing. But like colors that, that I like that we've come out with that'll be good across the board, whether it's stained, tannic, chalky, or clear water, yeah. um, the fire tiger is going to come to the top first. And that's a, a bright orange with a black pepper flake and chartreuse all mixed together. Yeah. And I always, always have liked the uh, chart pepper neon, which is a pearl white black flake and chartreuse. What pearl am I good? Black flake. Okay. Yeah, it's called chart pepper neon. Black it's got a glow. That neon's a glow. I could care less if it glows. It yeah. works. Um, and I've used pearl white a lot, but this, that, that fire tiger is, is a big go-to. And also, and I had some people today that I was talking to kind of question, you mean to tell me y'all didn't make a chartreuse, all chartreuse jerk shot? I said, nope. Now we have an all chartreuse five and six inch jerk shot, which is great too. Use that one. Um, and then some of the pink colors. Um, I've never been a real big uh, user of pink colors for flounder. I love it for speckled trout fishing, but I started playing with the pink shine. And then we have what we call just pink. I would have thought we called it hot pink, but it's a really dense, almost magenta bright pink. Oh. That's going to be killer. And those are colors that you can use in stained or dirty water. Uh, you know, it, it's been working both for me. When we get a lot of wind, the water gets stained up, still catching fish. But when it's real clear, I'm still catching fish. So, like, how, how much does color matter in the in the big? I mean, obviously, the area you're in is the most important because you yeah. have the best color out there, the best baits. So, like, have you ever done experiments? I'm always curious. Like, I like to believe it it matters, but I've never done like an experiment with two people on your boat side by side with completely different colors and. Is yeah, one's getting more strikes or not. And, and, and you know, and we won't get too far in, but I, I, it, depending on species, absolutely. Yeah. Speckled trout, definitely. But when it comes to flounder, here's what I found. Flounder, unlike some fish, is that I don't use many darker colors unless I'm in darker waters. But I found with flounder that lighter colors work good in dark water as well as, as, as clear waters. Okay. Which, you know, traditionally speckled trout, I use lighter colors in clear water, darker colors in tannic, darker water, stained water. But with flounder, it seems like that brighter lure works pretty good in both but then i will if i'm fishing just the river i might use a root beer or something like that for the flounder but why do that when you can use a pearl white or when these bright colors are working just fine so for me it kind of scales down the the realm and like that fire tiger has some darkness to it because it's orange and black flake and chartreuse so it's got that transition 
it looks pretty natural. You know, to us, we'd say that looks like a, a fish that's, that's uh, radioactive. But for flounder, it's that transition. They're on the bottom. They're getting the lowest light of any fish sure. by far. And sometimes that transition of color contrast really pays off. And, and so uh, with flounder, I'm not that picky on color. But some of these new colors excite me because they do give you that contrast. Cool. All right. So still in the summertime, we're talking inshore. I know you're doing some some you're not going offshore per se but you're going out yeah i call it near shore yeah. and, and, and you know you can catch these fish off the carolina coast 20 30 miles offshore yeah. especially in the cooler months uh in the summer months i keep it to about five or six miles at the most okay so i'm in a i'm, in a, tw I'm in a 22 foot bay boat so i'm looking for about 30 to 65 feet of water okay um, i mean we don't get deep very quickly at all you know at all um so i look for those and i'm looking for in the spring i hit a lot of artificial reefs okay. you know the, the what the state puts out and the fishing clubs put out um and what i found is by late june mid to late June, they start to get kind of fished out because we're, you know, everybody's going to those because you look at a map, there they are. And then later in the season, I start looking for hard bottoms and ledges. Um, and, and, and a lot of people say, why don't you go to your ledges to begin with? Well, I'm kind of saving those fish. I fish 200 days a year. I've got to keep my customers on fish. And so I'm going to fish where the fish are. And then as the, as the season goes on later in the year, I'm going to go further and further offshore. The fish aren't working further offshore. I'm just going to new grounds to find more fish that haven't been fished. And, and the reefs that I'm fishing lately are starting to get a little low. And I'm having to move a little further off or a little north, more north south or I'm finding that hard bottom. It doesn't take much. I look for low relief, two or three foot drops and stuff. Okay. Are they on big relief? Are they on the big ledges, the bigger ledges? Are they on the big artificial reefs? Absolutely. The problem is, number one, hang ratio. A lot more hangs on those bigger reliefs. And also, number two, is you find more pelagics that are going to cut you off and sharks, sharks because yeah, there's yeah. bigger structure. And then the barracudas that eat your great flounder on the way up are uh, really bad in North Carolina. So staying away, so when I'm on these big reefs, I stay away from the bigger high, bigger stuff where everybody else is fishing and get on the lower stuff. Yeah. The barracudas aren't as bad. The fishing's better, yeah. and it doesn't take much. Just a little little live bottom, a little, couple little bumps with some little fish on it. You know, it kind of lights up a little bit on your color fish finder. Yeah. Um, it doesn't take much. I mean, I have fished some buoy anchors around our inlet lately testing trying new areas because next year it probably will be doing more ocean flounder fishing with the regulations changing in North Carolina. Um, and I'm trying new stuff, and I mean, I've caught some flounder around the big concrete blocks not a lot but yeah. a few it doesn't take much because uh -huh. it's structure in the middle of nowhere yep so what are you doing differently with baits you're not using a gulp jerk shad anymore. well i'm I actually i'm using a gulp jerk shad right. um but but i'll actually scale down and go to a bucktail or a long larger jig head if i'm using a larger jig head and i'll go to like a three quarter or one ounce still long shank okay. um then i will go to i'll keep it in the six inch jerk shad or that that berkeley power bait grass pick if i'm using a bucktail and I'll, with a bucktail, since they have the fur, they sink a little slower. I will go to a one, one and a half, or two ounce. And I'll go with a smaller um, uh, uh, gulp bait, like a five inch jerk shad. Um, or even what's crazy about this, and, and you know, I have cleaned flounder my whole life, and flounder don't eat a lot of shrimp. They will, but shrimp's not their deal. They'll eat them. But because it's a, a good bait that lasts longer, I'll put a four inch uh, shrimp on the back of a bucktail mm -hmm. for my ocean flounder fishery because they can keep nipping at it. You still got a piece of good gulp, got that yeah. scent, got that action. And it kind of saves on gulp because the problem is in the ocean, there's a lot of little creatures like black sea bass uh, right. and sand bass Annihilated. and grunts and everything else and little snappers. So I actually started to use in a little more of a four inch uh, shrimp. Yeah. And now we have the all chartreuse three inch and four inch shrimp coming out in gulp with this new series. And I can't wait to put that chartreuse four inch shrimp on the back of a white bucktail. What a, what a contrast yeah. transition. It's, I haven't used it yet. It's going to work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's going it's going to work. So so yeah, I'll use those when the when the little trash fish get bad. Cool. And um the one thing we haven't talked about for summer here is, you know, tides, meaning mm -hmm. you you mentioned obviously uh certain areas, especially where you are, you got some mass massive changes. I mm -hmm. mean, 7, 8, 9 foot swings and yep. the tide do you like income and outgoing do you like certain you know it, it's it and i hate to say it we, we've tell, said this a thousand times when it comes to fishing is that you know the last couple two to three hours of the fall and the first hour of the rise is about as good as it's going to get but for flounder um you know if if i can't if, if if i'm on a tide where i'm trying to catch redfish and it's just not working i can go catch some flounders on any tide most important is it's moving when it slacks off, even in the open ocean. Time to get lunch, huh? Yeah, get lunch or make a move. I tell people either we're going to make a move or have a beverage because it's a good time to make a move because you're running and you're not burning during good bite time. Yep. Do that a lot if I need to. If I don't feel like the place is going to uh, start producing again or it didn't produce for the tide, yep. make a move, have a beverage. Um, but the biggest thing is even the open ocean, we'll be flounder catching flounder pretty good ocean. All of a sudden, it just drops off. 
I get the old tide app out or look on the Garmin, look at the tide app, and I'll be damn we're at the bottom of the top of the tide. So it, you know, the tide moves in the ocean too. These fish are affected by it. You just don't see that movement right. in the ocean, but it does make a difference. And I'll tell my customers, hey, it's probably going to slow down here in the next 15 minutes. We're coming into the tide. And it really, it does. So um, any tide, as long as it's moving lower into the fall, start of the rise is usually the best. That last hour on each side or beginning is usually when they get the best, but it's not as picky as trout or, or redfish. I will say that. Cool. So anything else in summer you can think of? Or we, um, to... No, I mean, just keep into that deeper water. Um, and I don't really think it's water temperature more than anything. I don't think they're going to deep water for cooler because our, our tides are so big up our way that the water temperature is staying at the bottom of the top. But I think more than anything that the sun gets high yeah. and there's more action in the water, more people in the water, and those fish are kind of getting to a, a calmer environment for them to be comfortable because they're trying to eat. Yeah. They're not trying to get away from you. They're trying to eat. Yeah. Cool. All right. Fall. Fall. Keep moving in. Fall, um, so fall, we'll start out with the inshore stuff. Fall, I'm going to start seeing those fish early fall are, are going to be very close to that summer. And, and for me, I'll just give you a, a, a water temperature is kind of tough, but I'm going to say month-wise. You know, I consider starting to get into later September, we're starting to get into fall. We're starting to get those northeast winds, starting to get a little drier air. Um, so in, in, in mid-September to um, late October, I'm still seeing those fish in those summer trends, those deeper waters, the water temperature is still pretty warm, yeah. it's starting to come down a little bit. But when we start to get into that, right in October, November, I start to see those fish really start to head to the inlets and stuff. And it can get quite good at the inlet. Now, I will not lie to you, no false advertising, by late October, November, I'm speckled trout fishing every day. <laughs> I mean, I don't run many flounder trips, but I catch a lot of flounders while I'm trout fishing. And at the very end of the trout season, a lot of our bigger trout are around the inlets. And we catch some really nice, I mean, last, last year we had an eight pound trout Ooh. on eight pound, line, eight pound okay. flounder on eight pound line on a little teeny 2000 pin conflict on a little four inch uh, Berkeley uh, grub, a power grub. Man. And you know, the lady thinks she's hung up and, and I pick up the rod and fill that. And I went, oh, and it, it took like, it was only eight feet deep and it took like 10 minutes to get the fish in. She'd wow. get it up and it'd go back down. So what I'm getting at is those fish move the inlet because they're staging to head offshore. Yeah. Do the flounder hang out in, in, in shore in the wintertime? They do, but in, in our area, very, very low numbers. But I've talked to some guys and guys down here in Florida that do a lot of fishing and say their stuff fish come in uh, in the wintertime. Sometimes their flounder fishing is even better in the wintertime. Yeah. So I would kind of take those fall scenarios, moving waters closer to inlets and stuff like that is where you're going to find those fall fish. Now the ocean fishery, um, until about early December, they're still on those inshore reefs in that uh, one to five mile range, 30 to 65 feet. Yeah. But they move on offshore in the wintertime. And, and a lot of times we go, we do a lot of grouper fishing in, in December because November, December is when our gag grouper get close to the beach in that 10 to 20 mile range. But if we strike out and it's not good, the bucktails come out. And last year in December in that uh, 15 to 20 mile range, we crush the flounder some days. I had Berkeley rep on the boat one day, been grouper fishing, few fish, black sea bass. So let's go in troll a little bit and catch some black sea bass on yeah. some wrecks to fill the box up, have some more to eat. We only had a couple groupers, got in there and had the Berkeley rep on there, another guy that does a lot of flounder fishing. He says, do you think the flounders are here? I said, December, eh, 15, 13, 15 miles off the beach probably. He dropped down a bucktail, first drop, six pounder. You should have seen the mayhem on the boat. People grab, you have a bucktail, do you have any gold? <laughs> We, did, we brought grouper reels, That's you know, and, and, and one guy had some stuff. We ended up catching nine keeper flounder in wow. 30 minutes wow. because they were there. They'd moved off. Yeah. But I don't normally target that. But now the bucktails come with us in December, and oh, if yeah. the grouper fishing strikes out, we're going to catch flounders. So on that, in terms of positioning, are you, are like, you know, John Skinner we had on, on the uh, Flounder Mastery we did mm -hmm. with you. Yep. And you know, he does a lot of the drifting. Mm -hmm. uh, are you guys doing that? Or are you anchored down? Like, what are you doing on, on the offshore, near shore? On the offshore, near shore, I prefer to drift. But here's the scenario with the bucktails. We're fishing heavy, very heavy structure. Even yeah. low-release heavy structure. You cannot drag that bait. You drag it, and within you're, 10 yeah, seconds, you're home. You're so what I like to do, if it's a very low-wind, calm, super calm day, and we're kind of between moons, not a lot of current, we get over the structure, on, on the low-relief structure, not the big stuff. And I get my customers to drop straight down and just lightly vertical jig. And then the boat slowly moves. And yeah. I watch a fish finder. We come off the bottom. Then I tell them to reel up. I crank up the big motor, move back over, and do it again. Got it. Trolling motor spot lock, absolutely. But I prefer not a spot lock because if you do that, you're, you're really not fishing area. Yeah. And if you can get a very slow drift going. Now, I have a drift paddle on my power pole, which has been really great. I've used it more this year than ever before because we've had some really calm days. But there's a little bit, a little bit of wind, yeah. so I put that drift paddle down, slows the boat down even more. Yeah. And that real, if that if that line 
gets a little bit angled, that's fine. But if you start seeing that line come out at a big angle, you're going to get hung up. It's the time to either use a spot lock on your trolling motor or put the anchor down and then make light cast 20, 30 feet out, not too far because if you go too far, then the angle changes and you're dragging in, yeah. you're going to get hung up. Yep. And work high jigs right tip up high so you're going across the bottom and you're not dragging. Yeah. Let out anchor line as you're going along or back up the trolling motor or go forward and move around every once in a while and keep casting at different areas around the boat until you catch fish. If you don't, make a move. Uh, the most important thing is, is not casting too far and don't let that line get an angle or you will be cussing me for losing your bucktails and gold. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So that's the most important thing is keeping that thing vertical. Cool. For sure. And when you, when you move out there, how far are, are you trying to like, uh, you know, fish the entire wreck or reef or, or ledge or whatever it is? Well, like well, how, how much are you covering? I, well, it's, as long as we're getting bites, I'm going to keep covering area. And yeah. pretty much what I do is I just got my tracker on my Garmin going. And if I have a, if we have some good bites and get you know one or two fish on in the same drift, we're going back through there again. There's yeah, more flounders. If stops. we don't, I'm just going to find out that drift pattern and I'm going to move over 20, 30 feet about what my casts are doing. My yeah. my customers are casting and start another drift in that same area. If I make a drift a few times and the fishing slows down, we've caught them. Time to move over a little bit. If we, after a couple of drifts in, an, in, a, in a in a bottom area, not getting bites, I'm going to go on and move 100 yards, 200 yards. Depends on the structure. Yeah. We have a lot of concrete rubble areas. Concrete rubble, park index, highway, where they dump that out there is the best. Because if you get hung, it comes out pretty easy because yeah. it's concrete with coral growing on it. And it's in very low relief, one to three foot chunks of concrete. Got it. That is the best, the best bottom you can find. So we have different piles that are marked. And you're constantly learning. There's plenty of times where I'll find some rubble that they didn't mark because, you know, these guys that are dumping it, they're not marking it. They say this is the general area. Right. And finding those ones that are a little bit away from the, the, the actual, what I call the tourist marks, that's, that's where you go. Every, you look over and all your customers doubled over in the rod because right. you found that place that's not getting heat. And it could be 100 feet away from the main structure. Wow. It could be 100 yards away, but those are the ones that will really fill your box up quickly. Love it. All right, anything else in that uh, fall time frame before we – moving to winter which i know is um not really i mean it's just the most important thing is 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 you know if, if you stop to see those fish drop off in the fall inshore when you know if you're catching finder pretty good and it will literally be like a light switch you'll be catching finders pretty good on the docks and all of a sudden it just stops and you need to start checking those inlets and getting off the beach a little bit They've, they're making their move and when they make their move they make their move in a couple days about a week and they all move it's not a one fish here, one fish there. I mean, they really do. And not really in school, so it's not like they all get together and go, let's go. But they start going. They start making their runs, making their moves. So when you, if, you, if it drops off in short, it's time to hit the inland ocean. And so in that inland ocean, you're saying we only got a couple days to, like, really maximize it. Yeah, especially on the inlet. I mean, I've had it where it was like we were trout fishing and we changed over to flounder baits because the flounder fishing was so good. Yeah. And then three days later, I'm doing the same thing, and we're back to trout baits because the flounders aren't there. They've moved the ocean. Got it. Yep. And so that happens in the winter. Yeah, it happens that that scenario happens late fall. Typically, for I see that big big move late November, early December in North Carolina. Okay. And if you had to give water temperatures on it, I'm going to say in the in the upper 50s, lower 60s. Okay. Um, and that's when the kind of the trout turnover as well. And we start seeing those fish in the in the, in the 50s, and our, we start seeing our bigger trout move around as well. And it kind of coincides with that. So do you do you go flounder fishing in the, in the winter, like in like December, January at all? The only time I do that is I'm off the beach and I'm grouper fishing or something like that. You know, unfortunately, you can't catch groupers in January. Our season closes January through through uh, through, through the uh, beginning of April. Um, so December, if I'm gag fishing, I'll do it. Every once in a while, I'll go out there and do some black sea bass fishing or something. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, I don't. I back off that that wintertime flounder fishery unless I happen to be out there for some reason trying to catch a black sea bass or something like that. Like how it, far out are they are they spawning? Oh man, thirty miles, forty miles. Got I mean, I, I know guys and gals. Um, you know, back in the day when I used, to, I used to commercial group fish and we fished all year, we'd catch twenty, thirty miles, forty miles off the beach. You'd reel up a cigar man and you got a four pound big old summer flounder thirty miles off the beach. Didn't happen a lot. Yeah. But there again. That's not the only one out there, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah, and yeah. we're not covering bottom; we're dropping a cigar into the bottom. Yeah. If you, if we, if we were to take the time back then to pr present a you know six eight ounce bucktail with a gulp on it, there's no telling what we could have caught. But yeah. we were trying to catch groupers. Oh yeah. So if there's one, there's more. Cool. You know, so they're there. You just got to go do it. All yeah. right. So when you when is the pick up again? Um, for me, you I really, I, you know, and I don't do a lot of early spring because those it takes. You know, it's funny. It takes colder water um, in the fall to push them off. Um, they, they, they'll, they'll stay, but it takes really warm water to really get them coming shore. And I don't see numbers of keepers 
until really late April and really, really getting into May. And what are you hearing like down in Florida though? Is... Um, Florida, March and April is phenomenal. Okay. I mean, they do very well. Yeah. I mean, they do very well on that turnover. Yeah. Um, water temperature wise, it takes for me high sixties before I really go, I will book a flounder trip Got and it. I'm catching a few, but there are a lot of little fish in the spring. Yeah. And it's crazy because literally in the last couple of weeks, we're starting to see those even bigger flounder. Here it is nearly mid July yeah. and early July, you know, I've been catching nice keepers, but now all of a sudden all the boards and people are posting, Hey, I caught my first five pounder. And then you see like five more people caught yeah, five yeah. pounders. It's like clockwork. Those bigger fish are really pushing in now. And so it shows the flip of it, you know, as it changes. But for me that, you know, right at 70 degrees, upper sixties, late April, early May, um, by mid May, I'm telling people, if they say, Hey, we want to book a flounder trip. I tell them mid May all for me. Got it. We're going to catch numbers. Can you catch them before that? Absolutely you can catch them before that. The difference is, is i got to put people on fish. Yep. And I'm not going to take them out there to catch one or two flounders, especially when most of them are going to be throwbacks. Yeah. I'm going to stay on the reds and the trout until I can feel sure and confident about it. So what about the, the weekend warrior, the recreational angler who just, let's just say it's March. What, where, where are they going? O them. Ocean or inlets. Okay, ocean there, or inlets. Okay. Yep, ocean or inlets for sure. They're still going to be quite good in the inlets. Um, I start seeing a, a fair amount showing up in April, and yeah. we'll be out there um, throwing for false albacore or Atlantic bonito or the big chopper bluefish around the reefs and the inlets in the spring. And every once in a while, a customer will it'll be slow. And I'll say, hey, drop down, drop a vertical jig down, try to catch a, a gray trout, a weak fish. Yeah. And they'll come up with a nice flounder. And it's like, okay, they're starting to show, but it'll be one in two weeks doing the same thing you know there's not a lot of them but they start to push in there yeah. uh in that april april you know range do you are, do you do you have anyone that or yourself that's ever targeting them in those like back country creeks like way back or is no that... i mean a, a little bit you know the scenario is is what i've learned i've learned enough and we have a lot of flounder giggers in our area and it really seems like especially the inshore you know southern flounder the big ones that get big don't go real shallow unless it's nighttime. They do yeah. move up on those bars at nighttime and they drop off. And it's kind of crazy because growing up around Wrightsville Beach, talking, I mean, I worked in a fish market my first job, talking to the giggers and the guys at commercial fish for the flounder is it's amazing. You would think they'd stay out, but when I'm coming to the boat in the morning and it's still dark outside, the, the giggers are already on their way home and it's still pitch black outside. And they tell me that when you see a little bit of light uh, in the Eastern hemisphere, just a hair, the flounders are on their way to the to the to the deeper water. Mm, that's interesting. And I, and it's weird, but I mean, I see that a lot. You think they would they would fish right on up until it got sunny because yeah, yeah. the visibility gets better. And you see those guys, huh. they are they are on their way home when I'm driving to get in the boat to run a charter at 5:30, 4:30 in the morning sometimes. Yeah. It really changes like that. They really start dropping down huh. to the deeper water. So that's the scenario. Ask, yeah, I, and, I and so they, I, I know people that catch them in the, in, up in those shallower creeks, but it's always in a bend in a creek where the water's deeper. Got it. They're, they, the, the guys that are on the stand-up paddle boards and stuff are, are, are seeing, they're pushing little flounders off the flats, right. but I've never heard people go, man, I pushed a seven-pound flounder off a flat today. If they did, it was a stingray. Yeah. They, you just don't hear that very right. often because right. those fish do drop down deep. Will they be in those holes? Absolutely. But I think once they get to a certain size, personally, I believe that once they get to a pretty big size, four, five, six pounds, they're moving to deeper water yeah. as they get bigger. They they like that deeper water. You're not going to see very rarely in our area, especially an eight-pound fish in a five-foot hole in a creek that's five-foot at low tide and ten-foot at high tide. It's just not a lot of water. Yeah. They just they're, 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 They need bigger bait. They need more food. Yeah. Everything drains out of there at low tide. So... That's that's my opinion, but from what I've seen, it just makes well, sense. Experience, yeah, it, yeah. It just it just hundreds of days a year. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it, it just I just don't see them up in yeah. there. And I fish the creeks a lot in the fall when those fish should be in those close to those areas yeah. catching trout. And we don't catch many flounders. Oh. We catch them out outside in the channels around the inlets and stuff in the fall. Cool. All right, yeah. so winter's over. It's starting to warm up a little bit. We're in that April May ish time. Like, what are you doing now? So are you still going to the same kind of places you were? Yeah, but but the difference is there is is I will see some pretty good flounder bites starting in the creeks in April, but it's a yeah. lot of little fish. Yeah. It's fun. It's fun, but yeah. just not a lot of keepers. You're yeah. doing a lot of measuring or not much measuring, all letting go. And when I'm up in those creeks in the spring is we do have, it's one of the few times of the year that besides the fall in my area that you can get a slam. You can get a trout, a drum, and a flounder. Yeah. Usually they're going to be on the smaller side. It's that early spring, little puppy drum, little small, little, little, little hammer trout, you know, little spikes and smaller flounder, but we can throw small baits, you know, three and four inch little, little jerk shads and little, little swim baits and stuff, you know, pretty much traditional trout bait. And I'm catching flounders and sometimes some pretty big numbers, mm. but some days never see a keeper. 
if I'm trying to target those keepers, I'm going to go on off the beach, during, especially late April and May. We're going to go off to the reefs where those bigger fish are starting to push in. Got it's it. still not great yet in late April and May. By mid-May, they really start to get on those reefs good. And by late May, early June, they're really starting to get inshore. And then as the summer goes on, the size builds inshore. Yeah. And in the ocean, it stays pretty consistent, those one to three, four pound fish. Cool. And same Berkeley... It, would you, was it a five or a six that you five used? and six use five and six and, okay. and how I decide what I use um, in the spring and, and, and fall if I know there's trout drum and flounder in that area all three I will throw a five inch bait because that bait is very good for all three yeah. if I'm targeting just flounder I'm gonna step up to the six okay. that's really the only do I catch plenty of drum and big trout on the on the six inch on accent on flounder fishing absolutely yeah. but for the consistency of a two or three pound or smaller trout it's nice to have that five inch bait they can get it in their mouth you catch them yeah. so that's really the only thing that changes but day in and day out six inch jerk shad is my go-to flounder bait if i'm targeting flounder got it um it, are you ever changing up the weights uh, like or anything different in the speed of your retrieval depending on the water temps or is there not really okay. um i think the most important thing is is where 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 anglers mess up is is you can go too slow not that you're not going to get a bite but you need to cover area and keep fishing. Because remember what I told you, covering area catches more flounder. That is the number one rule. Cut, cover, covering more areas can catch more fish. But you got to do it efficiently. The bait's got to be close to the bottom, not dragging, and not too far off. You don't want to jig it too light and it comes way off the bottom. He might jump right over flounder. He's not going to break his cover. It's not a trout coming in there and grabbing it. A flounder is matching the bottom. They're camellia, they're stealth, waiting for the bait to come to them. So they're not going to do it. So having it closer to the bottom is important. There again, we don't go too heavy. But short answer to that, mostly 3 8 ounce. Um, if I find an area where I'm on some fish good and, and it's a little shallower or the current's not that bad, I might go to a quarter ounce. But day in and day out, if you got some current, some depth, three eight seems to be just right. But there again, we're on a big bait. That bait's got that fall, uh, slower fall. Let's say I'm throwing a five inch jerk shad yeah. for trout, drum, and flounder, I'm going to go to a quarter ounce yeah. because that smaller bait's not going to have that drag, that fall. It's going to fall a little faster. Yeah. So let's get rid of the, the three eights and go to a quarter on a smaller bait. Cool. And I know one misconception, we've heard it in. People hear from someone like you who's on the water hundreds of days a year, like, oh, he's a pro. He's doing it all the time. But, I mean, you, you've got customers, and you're using artif you're using the same exact setup and rigs you just talked about. Like it, it, with some people who are not the best casters. and Absolutely. And, and, and you know, it, 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 it takes time. I mean, it, and I will tell you, we've talked about it before. When I, have, when I have better anglers on the boat, we do catch more fish. Yeah. Not for lack of bites, you know. But... It, the great thing is about this is is there's it's it's not like throwing a hard twitch bait or anything like that, having to have the paws and the double jerk and all that. It's yeah. just covering the area, not dragging, covering more area, keep on the move, give it a little while, a little bit more time than you would a trout spot or drum spot. Yeah. But if you're not getting the bites after 15 minutes or so, if you and another person are fishing, a friend, it's time to move on. Because yeah. many, 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 many times, and I would say more than 50% of the time, especially in the ocean fishery. I show my customers how to do it. They don't fish much. Throw out, show them what to do, wait for it to get to the bottom, keep that bell open until it gets down to 50 feet on the bottom, work that lure. I hook a flounder while I'm showing them how to do it. Boy, do they eat that up. You should see them grabbing the rods. They're here. They're biting. And that's always a great compliment to me, but it's awesome because I'm going along and I'm like, now if you feel dead weight and I'll have to go, oh my God, dead weight, set the hook. And they're like, oh my God, he's got one. So that's really cool it's too, but yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're like, give me a rod. You know, I make sure that all the rods are rigged before I do the trial run Understand. because as soon as not, I'm tying lures on real quick. That's pretty but yeah, it's just really keeping that lure moving and yeah. don't drag it, really. So, on the because I think most of the people listening are just, you know, they're inshore anglers, they're not offshore, even near shore for the majority, and they want to know how to catch them, uh, you know, around docks and bridges mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Are you finding that you're getting a majority of strikes? closer like underneath the boat like meaning are you having to make really long casts with flounder like you're not it's not like stalking a tailing redfish where you're worried about spooking them shorter cast shorter more that, meticulous cast work much that's better what I, was gonna, yeah. okay, that's I mean it doesn't hurt to throw long but no it, it for me is i the, these fish don't spook that easy especially if you follow the rules and stay in the deeper water for the yeah. bigger fish they don't spook they're they, they think you they can't you can't see them yeah. uh, there's plenty of times that i've gotten right on top of hunter before i pushed them away in a shallow flat early in the morning yeah. um they're usually small fish but those fish don't spook you they're used to boats they're used to boat noises i mean that you know they live in this 
So I feel like by having that, you know, there again, keeping that angle high so you can really jig is important. So those long casts are going to be harder to do that. You're going to have to go high. Oh, yeah. is more impo it's more important to stay short and just move over the area of the trolling motor and fish those areas or anchor up and make sure you're covering a lot of area with short casts. And if you need to move the boat, move the boat. You are, you're going to miss some fish on that long because what's going to happen is you're going to be jigging along and all of a sudden the dead weight's going to be like, gosh, is that a hang or something? Yeah. And you might not set the hook, and that fish starts feeling the pressure and spits it out. Where yeah. on jig, dead weight, oops, set the hook. Yeah, that's good. More efficient. It really is. So, what other, any other like big mistakes or even misconceptions about flying or fishing with artificial lures? Yeah, I mean, I'd say the biggest thing I hear a lot is, you know, the coming, the, you know, a lot of people talk about trying to get away from live bait. And there's nothing wrong with live bait fishing. But I can tell you when I changed over from live bait, I caught more and more keepers and bigger flounder. The very first year, very first year I switched over, I caught 11 and three, a customer caught 11 and three quarter pounder on my boat. <laughs> I guided him to it. Yeah, but that fish in the same area is always fish. Listen, those are more fish back there than they are now. We weren't catching them. And there's got to be something to do with that live, dragging that live bait across the bottom. Yeah. So for me, the biggest thing is, is understanding that, that when that fish bites, you set the hook. There's no waiting around like you do with live bait, or a lot of people do. You set the hook. You Don't feel that dead weight. Don't that, count to yeah. three, anything like that. And they consume it. I have so many photos of flounders, you know, 16-inch flounders, and inch legal flounders, and you can't even see. All you can see is a jig head in their mouth. I mean, they, they, they consume this bait. Yeah, they're it's, aggressive. I mean, they're... Very aggressive. And that, everybody thinks they have a small mouth. You open up a, you know, a decent-sized flounder's mouth with a pair of pliers, not your fingers, because they're sharp, their mouth opens up pretty big, yeah. surprisingly large. Yeah. Um, so, you know, making sure you feel that dead weight, set the hook, um, and, and more than anything is if you're throwing artificial, is don't get into that old scenario of dragging the, the, the Carolina rig. Don't drag that, that, that artificial like that. Um, make sure that you're balancing it, and I promise you'll get more bites and less hangs. Love it, man. Well, hey, where can uh, people go find out about you to book with you? I know you're Website is captainjot.com, whole word captain, J-O-T.com, and uh, social media is Captain uh, Jot Owens, uh, and on uh, Instagram, Captain Jot Owens as well. And I do uh, free give tackle giveaways, and I do fishing forecast every month. They're on the Salt Strong uh, page as well yeah, uh, just, on the app. You're just so helpful. I mean, I, everyone loves it. And I know you speak, and you do yeah, I do. Yeah, I do a lot of seminars. Yeah. And I do my own fishing school every year. Um, so, you know... Um, Social media is love hate relationship, but yeah. I love it because it works and yeah. it's great for the industry and learning stuff. Um, but if you want to know what's going on in, in, in Captain Jot's world, that's where you're going to find out firsthand for sure. I'm also on the uh, Pin Rod and Reel Research and Development team, so you'll get some sneak peeks on some stuff. Uh, also with Berkeley Gulp, get some sneak peeks of some colors before they come out. Um, sometimes I get in trouble for that, but we'll keep that between us uh, <laughs> until they catch me. Uh, but yeah, so if you want you know, if some cool stuff, check me out for sure on social media. Cool. Brother, this is awesome, man. Absolutely. Always a pleasure. Yeah, man. All right. Stay tuned for the next episode. And if you have any questions on this podcast or any of them, let us know in the comments, wherever you might be listening or watching. Let us know. We'd love to hear from you. We'll personally make sure we uh, respond to them. And thank you for all the love, all the support. If you want to know more about Jot, make sure to go follow him on all the social media handles and more about Salt Strong. Go to saltstrong.com forward slash podcast. You'll see all the old past episodes right there. You guys rock. We out.